Hello, it's the real Carl King, and if you're a fan of 8-bit video game music mixed with metal and maybe even my favorite, orchestra sounds, I'm actually scoring the music for a new documentary called Best of Five, the classic Tetris Masters. It's about some of the best players in the world of that crazy old game from the original NES, and it's directed and produced by my old friend Chris Higgins. There is a Kickstarter for it, it's ending soon, and you can find it at tetrischampion.com. That's Tetris Champion, singular. By the way, if you stick around after all the Tetris talk we do, Chris and I talk a bit about our high school days together in Venice, Florida. So let's find out more about this project. Best of five, the classic Tetris Masters. Hello, Chris Higgins. Hello, Carl King. How are you doing? I am all right. I have a lot of phlegm. I do too. I've had, a, I've had a morning of uh, a cold, cold morning. Yeah, it's, it's very right. cold and dry here. So I want to get to the first most important immediate question is when is this Kickstarter ending and what's your current stretch goal? Okay, Kickstarter ends Wednesday. Um, well, crap, I have to look at the actual date. The Kickstarter ends Wednesday, December 9th at, I believe, 5 p.m. Pacific time. So we have... As of this recording, about four days to go. We have the weekend and Monday, Tuesday, and part of Wednesday. So back it now. The back stretch it now. goal, yeah, the stretch goal is $16,000. Um, we are, at the time of this recording, uh, just below 15000 So if we make about another 1000 bucks, we will add a sixth episode to our documentary series. And that is 20% more episodes. 20% for... more? Well, yeah. that, that's going to be easy. You're going to get there for sure. But that should not stop people listening to this. Go and pledge for this thing. I have a trivia <laughs> question for you regarding all of this. <laughs> uh huh. Someone at some point made this video game a long time ago. And right. does anyone still make money from creating Tetris? Like is Nintendo somewhere still getting licensing money somehow? Or is it... Is it this classic version of the game? Is it currently for sale anywhere or, or what? Do you, do you need to go and buy an old beat up NES from the eighties? So answer all of those yeah. questions for me. <laughs> okay. I'm going to answer those in not the right order. So the game that they play in the classic Tetris world championship is the 1989 release of Tetris for the Nintendo entertainment system, the eight bit console thingamajig. And that game has not been sold since uh, I don't know, a long time ago. Um, and that license, I assume, has been expired and gone. So to answer your question, is anybody selling or making money off of those cartridges? Like, is anybody at the Tetris company, which is the name of the company that owns Tetris? Are they making money from that? No. Um, however, and, and, by, and by the way, to answer your question, do you need to get an NES and a cartridge to play the game? Yes. The best way to do that is like eBay or somebody's garage or something, you know, like find the gear somewhere. Um, having said that, there was an interesting development this year, Tetris Effect Connected, which is a modern game, you know, like a modern version of Tetris, which does make money for the Tetris company and all the great Tetris, you know, people. Uh, they added a new mode inspired by the retro game, inspired by this tournament playing the retro game. So it's called Classic Score Attack. And you can buy that like today. It just came out for certain platforms. It'll be on all the platforms by the summer, I think. It just came out when? Like right now, as we, as you just said it? It came out, I think, like um, three or four weeks ago. Um, it's, it's a relatively new update to the Tetris Effect core game. And they're calling it Connected. Um, but it's basically they added a new mode. And that new mode simulates very faithfully this 1989 tetris thing and adds a two-player version of it which is something we've spent uh, you know immense amounts of effort trying to recreate with two tvs and two nintendos ah. and computers they just built it in to a modern xbox game oh, that's so nice. that's pretty rad and that's like it's making me want to buy an xbox which most things don't so i'm excited about that i just thought of something uh here's here's a little story i can tell you real quick i was putting some stuff in a backpack yesterday and I was trying to um, fit my, like there's little pockets on the sides of the backpacks, you know, where you can like put, sure. the, put, the, put little weird, the weird ones. Yeah. I was, I was trying to put my drink in there and I was trying to push it in and it was like jammed. I'm like, what, 
what is in this pocket that I can't fit my drink? And I was kind of annoyed, <laughs> my, my water bottle. And so I reached in there and pulled it out. And guess what it is? It is a classic Nintendo controller. And hey! yes, that I nice. had shoved in that pocket when I was at my mom's house in Florida a couple of years ago for Christmas. And I found this in the attic. And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And I just shoved it in there and never thought about it again. Until <laughs> yesterday, I'm just like, what is jamming? What is what is in the way? What is causing a problem here? Oh, you've been carrying it with you every you know every time you take that backpack anywhere. That's I never even realize it. Yeah, and so listen to this little click. Th those are the buttons. Yeah, you want to hear my buttons? I'm gonna hold it up. I, I re I re uh what do you call it? Re rubbered them. You can hear them. Those are the, those are yep. Those are the buttons. Yeah. Yeah, you can get new, um, you can get these little kits because their buttons kind of wear out, they get mushy. And it's really easy to take apart. Um, you just pull apart a few screws off the back and you can put in a new uh, pad. It makes it clicky again. It's great. Oh, very nice. Why did people start obsessively playing this specific version of Tetris? Was there someone famous that did it and then everyone else did it? Or why this? I mean, I don't want to give away like the... Uh, this is one of the key questions of the movie, um, in a way. But I can tell you for sure that a lot of it came from a previous documentary called Ecstasy of Order, the Tetris uh, Masters. And Ecstasy of Order is about the creation of the classic Tetris World Championship. And the, the logic behind that championship, which is a you know an annual event, it's now been running, I think we're in the 11th year right now. Um, and that's what my film is about. It's about the fifth year. Um, that tournament looked at the Nintendo World Championship from the early 90s. And in that championship, which is where like, you know, the movie The Wizard, if you remember that magical piece of cinema, um, that thing, that competition, you had to play three games. And one of the three games was Tetris, NES Tetris. So that game has been in competitive Nintendo gameplay since the very beginning of the concept of competitive Nintendo gameplay. So kind of my hypothesis is, I think that's where that comes from. Um, and then of course the fact that then this, this tournament was created around that game by itself, not with the other games included, um, has further cemented that game as a specific option. And the, the other big reason is it's a puzzle game and it's really hard. So <laughs> it's difficult enough. It's, it's not like, it's hard to compare it to other games, but in the sense of, um, you know, like checkers or chess or something like that, you, it's, it's more like chess. You would have to get, you have to spend some effort to get good at this thing. Um, and there are enormous differences between the world's best players and a brand new player. So it's exciting because you can tell what's happening. If you, even if you know nothing about the game, you can just look at it and be like, oh, I, I see how that works. Um, but to actually play at that level, you have to have practiced for thousands of hours. There was a guy who came over to my house when we were filming. Uh, I helped you film a little bit of this documentary at some point, some interviews. There was a guy who came over and played extremely fast Tetris. Can you right. just can you just tell us what that was and then we'll move on so people can look that up? Because it was <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah, so that's John Tran, also known as Blink. And Blink is the founder of a, an online community called Hard Drop. And so you can go find Hard Drop and join it if you want. And Blink is um, one of the preeminent players, what we call Guideline Tetris. So after the Nintendo version came out in 89, uh, I'm not sure exactly when it was, but it was, a, it was years afterward, the Tetris company looked around and said, oh, we have all these versions of Tetris that exist, and they all have slightly different rules, you know, and like some of them are hard and some of them are kind of easy, and the, but they have like some of them have a next box and some of them have multiple next boxes showing you how many pieces are coming next and what they are. So the Tetris folks sat down and made these guidelines, and they said every game is going to have a certain set of things. And it's like, it's not really important what they are. But the point is all modern games after <laughs> the one that we're playing in this tournament um, have a common set of rules. And those rules allow you to play in a totally different manner because the randomness is different. There are special features that let you play at this unbelievable pace. I believe he was playing Tetris Friends, I think. Um, but there are many of these modern, they call them guideline Tetris games. Tetris 99 is a good example of them. Uh, that's on Switch, I think. Um, Tetris Effect is also a guideline game with a couple of minor exceptions. 
Um, but all the modern Tetrises can be played with different kinds of controllers too. So like the NES controller, the little clicky thing is a major limiter. If you can play with a keyboard and you can like assign functions to those keys, you can go faster, which you can't do on a Nintendo. Um, so yeah, John was playing, um, I think he was playing Tetris Friends and it, it is a totally different vibe, even though it's still Tetris, right? It's all the same pieces. It's the same basic rule set. But because of some slight tweaks to how the rules and timing work, it just let him go like a fiend. Like, it just like, it's unbelievable how yeah, fast Yeah, I've played that. I've played some clips of him to people, and they're like, that's not real. It's just sped up. And I'm like, no, no, no. I saw that guy in front of me playing like that. It's it's unbelievable. So everybody out there, go check out, what's his name? Blink, or Blink. His, his real name is John Tran. And his, his community is called Hard Drop. Hard Drop is a term for when you drop a piece... Um, instantly from the top to the bottom of the screen. Um, soft okay. drop is something else. I think that's when you I push see. it down. Both of us are working on this film, even though it's kind of your film. Uh, what are we both doing on it? You're the producer, and well, among other things, you're the, you're the producer. And what I've realized in working with you on this is you are really good at producing. And <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> can you. Can you tell me what the heck producing is from your point of view? Let me put it this way. I thought I was directing this film but I guess I just assumed that the things that a producer would traditionally do on a film were things that were the director's problem because I didn't have a producer. It was just me. So as far as I know, <laughs> the role of a producer is to be an organized, coordinated person who makes sure things happen, right? It's like, do people show up on time? Did they sign the paperwork? Uh, is there money? Are there snacks? Um you know, all the pieces of making sure things move. Um, I just assumed as the guy making the movie, like, cause it's just me. I didn't have any like money or anything. It was just like literally just me and a camera. I assumed, well, of course I'd like bring all the paperwork and do all the stuff. Um, and, but yeah, I keep getting this note from folks we're working with, which is, oh, you seem very organized, uh, for a, an indie movie director. And I'm like, um, well, thank you. But I think it comes from years of working as a project manager, like as a, a tech guy. And like, I know what Gantt charts are and I know how to assign resources and I understand waterfalls and parallelism and all this stuff that frankly, when you're making a five part, well, maybe six part documentary series, there's a lot of people who have to work on it in little pieces. And so the management piece of that, how, who does what, when, have they been told they're going to have to do something soon? Are they ready? All that stuff is kind of the producer's problem and job. Uh, so is in some ways bringing in the money and making sure that like you didn't spend all the money before it's time to pay, write the checks, um, all that stuff. So there's also kind of the creative and decision-making stuff of being a director. But quite frankly, like I'm pretty good at being organized and telling people, you know, hey, in January, you might have to worry about, about this. So who's ready? Um, and what's funny to me is in the team, I keep finding folks who are like, wow, that was such clear communication. I've never worked on a team with anybody who ever warned me that I was going to have to do work soon. <laughs> <And I'm laughs> like, how does this work? Like, how do people get work done? I don't, I don't get it. But uh, yeah, so my technically, I am the producer, the director. We have an assistant director, um, Gilbert Tang, who is like awesome and is doing, frankly, a lot of the directorial work. Um, I'm also doing closed captions, audio description, uh, sound mix. By the way, you like doing that uh, closed caption stuff. Uh, I do. With with like three sentences, can you tell us why you are an advocate of that? Yeah, I believe people with disabilities deserve to watch movies. If they can't see, I think they should have audio description, which is something that's a verbalized, you know, description of what's happening on screen if there's something visually important. So I'm doing that. And if they can't hear or can't hear, you know, uh, if they have some challenge in hearing, then they should have closed captions that show what is being spoken or, or heard. And I believe that in the way that I believe it's a human rights thing. Like, it's important to me. A lot of movies don't have that. A lot of movies do have that. Um, certainly movies on this budget typically have neither one. Um, but I think it's important, so I'm doing it myself. Uh, that's probably four or five sentences. Who else is working on this thing? Uh, is there anybody else uh, important before we get to talking about the important stuff that I'm doing? <laughs> there are a lot. Let me take a look here really quick at 
I'd say the most important person who doesn't get mentioned a lot is Gilbert. Um, Gilbert Tang is the assistant director, and without him, this wouldn't have happened. Uh, he was like, you know, he, he's responsible for a lot of the creative and production decisions that have made it like possible to exist. So Gilbert is the main man. Um, aside from Gilbert, of course, you, Carl, um, you are doing a surprising amount of stuff. Um, I guess we'll get into that in just a second. Uh, Josh Boykin is also a huge deal. He is the narrator. So we will have narration as, you know, like explaining what's happening. Um, and he will be doing that. He runs a website called Intelligame.us. And he is one of the most generous and like intellectual without being snobby kind of people around games that I've ever met. And in, anyway, I'm, I'm super excited to have him involved in this. In addition, Chris Tang and James Chen are going to re-commentate all the matches. Um, they are kind of the modern uh, Tetris commentary team, and only one of them um, was actually, Chris Tang was was in there in 2014. We're going to have them redo all the commentary in the modern style. Um, Ryan Douglas is the editor. Um, Ryan lives in Portland now, and I've actually worked with him on a couple of different films or worked like tangentially with a lot of you know friends in common. He has edited several documentaries. The Palindromists is currently on the um, uh, the festival circuit. He directed a cool movie about um, a studio in New York City, I believe, called Sound of Chaos: The Story of BC Studio. That's pretty good. Um, anyway, he is the editor, uh, of course, Mr. Carl King, and Lucy Bellwood is the audio description narrator. So we mentioned the idea of. Um, if you're someone who is visually impaired and you need to hear things described to you, you need a voice that is unique, that is not the same voice as like the director, like asking questions off camera, being like, why did you get the score on the thing? So Lucy is the one who will perform the script of um, the visual things that are happening. Like, you know, James turns to the side and sees something or whatever. Um her voice will appear alongside narration and other things. And you can turn that on or off depending on whether you want to hear it. But that currently is the entirety of the team. We may also have some folks doing um, translations of the closed captions. Because I don't know, for example, Japanese or Spanish very well. Well, I'm pretty impressed that you put that team together and coordinated it and made people do things. So good work on that. Thanks. It's like a, it's like a pr producer job, right? It is. It's so weird. <laughs> Do you want to ask me about the music that I plan to do? I do. I mean, actually, we probably have to have a meeting about this soon. But I, so just for the, you know, for the record, the, the two things you're signed up for are kind of odd in that they're, you're that's the same person doing both, but you're doing the original score. And it's very important to me to have original score in this movie. Like, again, a lot of movies at this price point, at this budget would just get stock music and that would be it. But really, I mean, there just would be no score whatsoever. Um, but I think score is really important. And I happen to know somebody who is like not just an excellent musician, but has been investing in becoming like doing film score. So it's like, well, hey, Carl, want to do that? And the other thing you're doing is color correction, which is a technical task related to whether the colors of the various shots, because they're all, we shot on 15 different cameras or whatever, whether the shots all look kind of correct, you know, color wise. But I'm curious what you, like, when you think about Tetris, and you've seen a lot of it because you, you know, you shot parts of this, um, what do you want to bring in? Like, what kind of emotions or experiments do you want to run in making this score? First of all, when I'm actually scoring something, it's actually um, a little bit more of an immediate and visceral experience of following the rhythm of what's happening and the mood of what's happening figuring out a sort of tempo of the scene of like feeling like, is this a fast scene, a slow scene? Is this high energy? Mm -hmm. What's the feeling of it? So you've got to come up with these kind of elements. It's, it's different than writing a normal song. Something that I really want to do is, which is very challenging in the past. I've tried to do this, but bringing in both like a rock band sound mixed with orchestral stuff. And then I'm adding a third element, which is using old eight bit sounds. Yeah. And trying to trying to uh, replicate some of the themes. I think we are using some of the actual themes from the game, and then reorchestrating them and changing them up, and and doing some like theme and variation stuff on them for fun. But blending those three different 
worlds together in an interesting way is uh, it's tough to do because, okay, you can describe it as each of those types of music, those three things happen in different sized rooms actually in the real world. Like 8-bit music is in a tiny little speaker. There's no, there is no room. There's just like a little beep sound. Right. And then a rock band plays in, you know, a medium sized room, or, but actually has a lot of dry sound. It's pretty dry, but there's still a bit of reverb. And then orchestra is just this giant, you know, reverb in a, in a, uh, like Disney hall or something. And so trying to mix those three things together and make each one sound good is, is an interesting challenge. And, and so far my solution has been to jump between them quickly. Uh, but there are other ways of blending them. So that's an interesting challenge there. That's the biggest thing that I'm trying to do. And it's going to be fun because I, I, I really like the sounds of all three of those things. Yeah. And the Kickstarter video itself, it, it has your score, um, yeah. which yeah, that's I can't true. think I've, I've made probably a dozen Kickstarter videos for other people and none of them have like custom score <laughs> for the Kickstarter video. And the thing about it to me, it's kind of wild and good is that it doesn't get old. At least not to me. I've heard that tune over and over and over and over again, right? Because what was just... the name of that thing? I don't even know, but it's the song that goes da 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 da. You know, like I'm bad at sing- singing tones, but it's the sort of like yeah, it's like some old school Russian thing, a classical sa- piece yeah. that was borrowed for the NES and yeah. re- reworked it into a rock kind of metal format, a light metal. Kinda, it's to me, it's like rock metal with a little bit of orchestral flair. Yeah. Yeah, and it's got a real, happening. it's got a bigness to it. And the bigness yeah. is like really what makes it in this context makes it work. But you also sent me some examples where you were like, here's just the strings. And honestly, like the, just the strings part really works. Like that could work in an entire section of, you know, <laughs> yeah. an interview or something like it's not, it, it, I'm fascinated by the idea of variation just by kind of removal, um, mm-hmm. because a lot of film music, you know, like it doesn't have, we don't have to, everything doesn't, everything doesn't have to be, you know, uh, you don't want everything to be a hundred percent volume all the time, right? Like hundred percent right. high energy. And so I guess you know that better than I do, but the idea of there are parts of this where it's like energy, 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 energy. And then there's lots of parts where it's just like, okay, we're hanging out, we're learning, we're feeling, we're waiting. And then it's back to energy, 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 energy. And mm-hmm. then it's like, okay, now we're back in somewhere else. And the the I I think that that's something you have such control over and understanding that I am, I'm psyched. And that there will be there will be like a soundtrack, you know, like an actual thing that you can then say, look, I made a like this. Here's an album worth of music that came out of making these episodes. I think that's super cool because I listen to soundtrack albums all the time. Like that's kind of one of my hey, favorite things too. is back on music. Yeah. Yes, sir. Everybody who doesn't want to listen anymore, go <laughs> pledge to that Kickstarter. Let's get us to $16,001. Tell us what that URL is, Chris Higgins. All right, it's tetrischampion.com. That'll bring you directly to the Kickstarter project. It'll just kind of redirect you over to the weird long URL, tetrischampion.com. I wanted to ask you about our history for those who, yeah. are, who are actually still listening. Uh, do you remember how we met? Because I know we sort of went to high school together, I think. But do right. you remember the first time we talked or hung out? And I think it was at that fruit stand across the street from Venice High School. But See, but what do you what do you what do you remember? Okay, A, I don't remember. Uh B what fruit stand? <laughs> Look, wait, like Re-explain to me where was this fruit stand? Like relative to the high school? Like you're, if you're, let's say you're in the parking lot, right? And you're looking toward the library or something. Yeah. So you go out onto 41 and t- you know turn right when you leave yeah. the school, and you drive down a little bit, and there was like a you know a produce stand that was like an open air thing, and kids would sometimes go like stop by there or as they're walking home or whatever and buy an orange or something. Was this and, like a Nokomis Groves fruit stand, maybe? Well, it wasn't in Nokomis. It was like right well, there. No, it was like right by the school. So I have, I have, sadly, I have no memory of, of said fruit stand, but I totally believe you. I mean, I remember like the a root beer stand. Remember that thing? That was like not on the island, I don't think, but there was a root Are you beer talking stand. About, you're talking about the one that's in South Venice? I guess. I don't even know where it was. It was on a, like a Yeah, that was, that was the frosted mug. 
The frosted mug. There we go. Yeah. Anyway, the point is, no, I don't remember. Well, here's the here's situation. You're, uh, you were the same age, I think, as my brother, who's three years ahead of me. So when you're in a high school setting and you come in as a freshman in your first year and your brother is three years older, that person is a senior in their like fourth year, the final year. And in my case, that afforded me a lot of like free, I don't know what, but like essentially all the teachers already knew who that guy was, my brother. Yeah. And they would, there was a lot of transference onto me. So, um, you know, my math teacher thought I was him, even though we're not, we, we look different, we sound <laughs> different, but, and I'm very bad at math and he's extremely like, you know, very, very gifted at math. And so he kept being really disappointed at how bad I was at his math class. Anyway, um, but it's, it's, there's a bit of a gap because it's three years, right? And I think you're in his same year. So we were kind of like in that same space, but not quite in that same space. And, but I knew of you even before I went to that school because like, you know, Carl King, he's in, you know, he's in these bands and, uh, and you had like big hair and, um, huh. all, all I would really, all I knew at the time before we met was Carl King is hands like, like far and away the best musician in town and <laughs> yeah. well, and, and has that's this funny. like, yeah, well, that's what I knew. I mean, and yeah. true or not, I mean, it's, I've seems true to me and, uh, that you were, like kind of confusing. Like I wasn't sure if you maybe you were evil or mean because I'd never heard yeah. you speak, I don't think, but I'd seen you from afar with like long wow. black hair. And I was like, this guy might be um he might be in a secret society or something. Might be like a devil worshiper or something. Potentially, who knows? Um but then I'd gotten the tapes of um I gotten some of the Voice of Nothing tapes and you're probably I was like, like this doesn't correlate. Like why does it sound like this? Well, it all, yeah, it was like, there was a lot of confusing spices. It's kind of like if you have a situation where you have a chef who knows like one kind of thing and then some other chefs who know like entirely different like cuisines from different parts of the world. Yeah. And then they all just kind of got in a room and just started like going for it. But there was the thing that kind of got to me was there was an element of goofiness and fun and, um, I mean, not like chipmunk vocals, but sometimes just like playing around that mm -hmm. seemed it seemed to indicate to me that you probably weren't going to be like mean, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so I don't know when we first actually began to talk and hang out. I really don't. And I kind of wish I did. I probably, I think it was it more out. later in college that we at college age yeah. that we finally connected. But yeah, from what I remember of you is you had uh, this interesting look. <laughs> well, please describe, please describe the look for the, uh, <laughs> oh boy. you had, you had really long hair. I mean, both of us I had, had really, really long, long hair. hair, but your, I think yours was even longer than mine. Because mm -hmm. I would do these weird things where I would shave it underneath and do like the Mike Patton thing. Yep. But you like grew it out really long in a ponytail, I think. It was hi it was hippie long hair. It was the kind of like, I don't give a damn. It's just here we go. Let it let yeah. it go and, and ponytail kind of deal. Yeah. Yeah. And then you had like this huge, really distinct vest. And what was that vest? Was that like a photographer's vest? It's a, it's a photojournalist's vest. However, there's a lot of crossover between photojournalist and fisherman. <laughs> like there's a very similar kind of vest for your fly fishing and stuff. So people would read it in one of two ways. And usually oh. it was the fishing one. And I'm like, I don't know how to fish. I mean, I'd been <laughs> fishing, sure. But I'm like, they'd be like, oh yeah, a fisherman vest. That's very interesting. And it had a lot of pockets because I was always carrying like a Walkman, a couple tapes, sometimes a camera, a couple of rolls of film, <laughs> a, two pens, a pencil, some AA batteries, I mean, I was equipped, man. And so people would yeah. come up to me and be like, do you have a lighter? And I'd be like, I do. I don't smoke, but here you go. And I'd like, you know, reach into <laughs> one of these weird Velcro pockets and just hook them up. But I mean, to to, to be clear, I wore this vest every day, everywhere. Yeah, it was your thing. It was like, there's the guy with the vest. <laughs> For like five years. Nobody, nobody had one. I had never seen anyone wear something like that in my life. And you had that distinct vest that like set you apart. I, yeah, I mean, in retrospect, um, I don't know how my life would be different if I had chosen to wore, wear like regular clothes. Um, but there was a long, the vest period probably lasted four or five or maybe even six years. It lasted into college and then I kind of ditched it. Um, but what was your initial thought on, on doing that? Like, why did you, did you do that just because it had a lot of pockets or were you like thinking I am going to be a journalist slash photographer slash documentary filmmaker someday. So why not start wearing one? Well, there's two ways to answer that. One of them would be the way that sounds really romantic and cool. And the other way would be the truth, uh, which is my mom bought one for my brother because it had a lot of pockets. 
and he didn't like it. And so he was like, ah. uh, I mean, it's her birthday present or something. And he was kind of like, yeah, I don't know. It's just not my, I don't want to deal with this. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, but it, his one didn't fit me. It would have to be like a size or two bigger, but we were going to return it anyway. Cause I think it was, I don't know, it was probably 50 bucks. It was not, you know, totally inexpensive. And so I kind of horned my way in and said, can I get one? Like if you return it, can you swap it for like a bigger one? And I could just wear it. And my, you know, my mom was kind of like, sure. But <laughs> it was all about the pockets. I was like, look, man. Um, I want to have a pencil and a pen and, you know, I just want to have stuff with me at all times. It's a little bit like, you know, we didn't no, have, I get that. Yeah. I, it, I, I did some of that as well. So, yeah. I mean, I, I, for example, I had a capo. I always had a capo and picks, guitar picks with me always mm -hmm. for years. I carried a capo, which is one of the <laughs> least useful tools in the <laughs> world. And it never came in handy. Um, but I had it. And, you know, anyway, so it was, it was just about pockets. And I, I will say that like, um, it definitely set me apart in a way that that plus probably the hair, um, I think made it really confusing to people around town or certainly around school as to whether I was a teacher <laughs> or <laughs> another student or someone there just doing an article. I don't know. Um, but yeah, no, it was just, it was a convenience thing. And then once you started doing it, it was kind of hard to stop doing because people would see you without it and be like, um where's the vest, bro? Like, I, did something wrong? Like, did it get stolen or whatever? Yeah. Just to, to cap this off, I would say that the way that I viewed you in high school was I knew you were kind of in that very educated, um, sort of gifted kind of crowd, right? Is that is that correct? Yeah, they had, they had put me in the track of like the they sometimes they call it talented and gifted these days, tag. Um but they'd put me in the track of like, oh, smart kid, super conventional, you know, family is from the northeast and like, you know, like I I I was initially clean cut before I decided to go wild with the hair and the all that stuff. So yeah, they were just mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, put them in all these fancy classes with this very small sliver of the the upper crust. Uh and that's where I was. And as far and, as that goes, I was on the total opposite end of the spectrum. I was like in, at, at some point I was in dropout prevention and they put me in like weird special classes where they let us take naps yeah, and have nap time and stuff like that. Looks <laughs> like, like in high, like in high school. And, uh, yeah. I yeah. was excited when I had that, but, but, but my mom found out and got me taken out of it. I was like, damn it. I, this was great having quiet time and the lights off and nap time in high school. <laughs> but, um, so we were totally opposite, like, I think maybe views of high school or something. Cause I was like this total screw up. I, I just was falling through the cracks and, um, the way I viewed it is like, oh, there's that guy who's in the gifted stuff. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of interesting that years later we ended up kind of colliding with, I, I started realizing like, man, this guy, Chris Higgins has such a amazing creativity. And we had like this mutual friend Aww. and then we kind of started hanging out and it was like, man, this guy is just so talented. And, uh, that's finally where it came together. But I don't know that back in high school, if our creativity would have lined up, I think I would have been too confused sure. by you and <clears throat> you'd be too confused. Uh, but speaking of high school, what would you say, uh, what, what would you have said back then? <laughs> if, if I were able to go back in time and say high school Higgins, Someday you'll be making a documentary about Tetris because I think you'd be like, right on. That's exactly what I want to do. I think but I might've what, said, what's Tetris? Oh, right. That's the video game. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. But just to really quickly respond to what you're saying, I felt really, um, and I still feel really bothered by the idea that there were so many talented and smart people who were arbitrarily put in the like... I'm not sure if I should swear, but like the, the other side of the tracks, you've just sort of dumped over here in this other area. And I had like, most of my friends were either from the like highest end, like, you know, smarty pantsy classes or the lowest end, like, you know, vocational educational kind of thing. And hmm. I was like, this is not just like, this is socially not correct. And so I was involved in a lot of protests when they were trying to defund like, um, ideal and stuff like that where they're trying to defund those those programs i never knew that well i was that you know me and andy snyder uh, i have a lot of photos of those protests in high school because i i thought well i knew that i was like there is no actual relationship between the level of 
talent and education and, and sort of smartness of these two groups, there is definitely mm. a difference in how the, the like, whatever you call it, like the sort of the school views them. And it was oh, yeah. unfair. It was dumb. You know, one of my best friends, I remember my friend Amy was in a similar track that you were in. And it was like, this doesn't make any sense because she's like smarter than me, like <laughs> measurably. And yeah. she clawed her way. It was really hard to claw your way. It was basically, you were put into a, like a caste system where you just got right. stuffed into one or the other. And I showed up yes. because, because my brother had already been there automatically, regardless of whatever yeah. was going on with me, I was going to get put in the same place. I knew but, that that type of thing was going on, but it was, it was very difficult to get anyone to admit it, like in the administration or anything oh, like yeah. that. Like, like I started in, in gifted programs in elementary yeah. and then I did really bad in middle and then really bad in high school. But it was clear to me yeah. that kids were being separated uh, in that floor, that early 80s, 90s Florida way where you're either, okay, what are we going to do with these kids? They're either going to fix cars or they're going to be doctors. Yeah, And it was exactly. like this weird polarity of like, why, why are those my only options in life? And so <laughs> I was pushed into the, you're going to go bag groceries type of career path. Yeah. And I, I think that was where, you know, for example, when I would see you play music and I would be like, oh, or when I finally, you know, would meet and talk to people, you know, you or other people who were like stupendously talented and not just talented, but also skilled, like you had, you had learned how to do things. Um, it was really painfully obvious that there was no reason for this to be happening. Um, and that the opportunities that were just handed to me because I wandered in the door were not earned. And so I got really pissed off about that because like, I mean, I, I remember the first day I went to Venice High, they had me go and shake the hand of the principal and go have a meeting with him. What? Why, why would I have a meeting with the principal of Venice High School? A meeting as a freshman. Why? Because he knew I was going to go on and be probably similar to my brother and like, you know, get scholarships and like bring some level of prestige to his school. And his big test, this is a true story, was he would shake your hand and his name was Dan Parrott. Um, I remember he, him very well. He had been in, in uh, I think he'd been in Vietnam, and he was missing oh. a couple of fingers on his right hand, like little bit, you know, bits and pieces. So his test was, he sort of, and again, this is one of the most bogus things I can imagine, but his test was he would thrust out his hand before you had a chance to figure out what was going on and shake your hand. And if you, like, realized that there was something unusual about his hand, then you, like, failed his test. And I had been pre-warned because people in my cir social circle had had the same test and maybe hadn't passed it. But I walked right in there and I like grabbed his hand and slapped his back and we went and had a meeting about where, what I, where, where do you want to go in this school, Mr. Higgins, you know? <laughs> and it was bonkers because over here is Carl King, who is like, you know, essentially a maestro who was being encouraged to take naps. And then, yeah, anyway, so like... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what what high school Higgins would say if you said if you you know if time traveler me went back and said you know like <laughs> to nineteen ninety I don't know six or something and said look in twenty twenty a there will still be a world uh, you know b you'll be making a film um, and you'll be making it with Carl King I would be like <laughs> first of all I'd be like I was right he's a genius and then I'd be like. I get to make a documentary as my job? Yeah. Yeah. Like, sign me up. What do I have to do? So I would be jamming. I'd also probably be a little bit scared just because, like, I don't know what I'm doing. But uh, then, I, then I would think about it and be like, oh, well, I have 26 years to figure it out. So, um, or whatever, 24 years. I'm not good at math. But I, <laughs> I realized, like, <laughs> that's what I would do. But I, I think, no, I think it's, it's natural. Um but uh, I, it, it's a, such a wonderful thing to work with people you've known for a long time and who are kind of your friends because you can count on them to give you a little bit of slack at times and to be honest about like, this is what I need. Okay. This is what I need. Okay. Let's meet right there. Let's figure, figure it out. And that's, yeah. you have so many times been like super generous with time and help and all these things. And so I always feel like we're kind of in mutual debt to one another where it's like, you do a little bit of thing, I do a little bit of thing. And it, it that's a functional relationship. I love it. Yeah. And it's like, I, I always try to approach you as like, hey, would it be valuable to you if we did this thing? If Is there some way that you can right. use this? And, and so it's good. Yeah. I mean, and, that's and a, like, I enjoy a, like working a, that way. Yeah. A functional creative relationship, right? Like where you, you know, 
we, we, we're not, we we're doing our own things or whatever. We're not like co-directing this movie or something, but like, it's not out of the possibility that someday we might or whatever. Like, and I, there are a few people in the world where I would put that level of trust in someone just to be like, for example, when I went down to shoot in LA and you were, you were just everything. You were the like camera department, the lighting department and the sound department, which is something I never give up. I'm like, no, I have to do sound because I'm very picky about this. I knew you could do it because I had seen your documentaries before. And so I was just like, all right, fine. All I have to do is focus on having a conversation with this person in front of me. Right. And that was such a load off. And you drove. I mean, sign me <laughs> up. I'll just pay for a few burritos and, you know, call yeah. it a day. So, uh, man. Burritos are very important. <laughs> not so much now. I mean, you know, but at the time they were they were vital fuel. Well, I remember picking you up at the airport and sitting around just waiting for restaurants to open because you got so here so early. And I was just like, <laughs> all right, first plan is the food. Like, that's what that's what it is for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to point out how cool it is that uh, both of us have gone on to we've now grown up. It's been I don't know how many years since high school. I feel like I've been doing this stuff for 30, 30 years or so. I've been doing musical yeah. projects and films and blah, blah, blah. Both of us have held it together and done these things that we would have been really excited about in high school. Like to think that, hey, someday we could actually be doing these things. And I had a lot of doubt that I would eventually ever be able to do any of them. Uh, I had a lot of like anxiety that like, what if someday I'm not allowed to do it? Or what if I'm, what if it just never happens? Like, I think deep down I had this drive to really want to be able to do these projects. And I think growing up in Florida, since we didn't have any opportunities or we didn't really have any equipment and now we have everything and like, Hey, we can actually do this stuff we dreamed of doing. That's really cool. Yeah. It, it is legitimately important. And, uh, it, it it's, I think my, for my first, <laughs> this is an example of another, you know, like where kind of where we came from, but like, I think my first tape I put out in 1992. And I think my first big article, I want to say it was in 1990, like my first, you know, magazine article that was on, it was a cover, it was a cover story. And I went down to Walden books to go get the magazine because that's where we were at. Um, the fact that it's still possible that it, it did work out that we could get to creative careers kind of shocks me. And like, um, yeah, it's a privilege. It is an absolute privilege. And that's part of why in the making of the stuff, I'm really keenly aware of that and that, you know, I try to ask for the absolute minimum, right? Like I want to use my, my privilege that I get to make something that then brings folks in, right? Like, so people with disabilities, for example, I want them to be able to enjoy the movie. Um, I want to charge a fair price for things, you know, I want to make it as, as cheap as I possibly can. Um, and I am just happy that it worked out. Uh, and at times it didn't, at times I, you know, I, I've had lots of other jobs over the years, but I was able to come back to this stuff and keep doing it. Um, so here we are <laughs> and, where, and where will we be in 20 more years, uh, with our even stranger beards and our, you know, older ways being like, remember that time there was a fruit stand? What fruit stand? I don't remember the fruit stand. <laughs> <laughs> like some kind of Muppets characters, you know? Um, but I, I guess, I guess put it this way. Who would have thought that two kids from Venice, Florida, which is pretty much nowhere, which had, which had pretty much no kids in it, you know, like relative to the number of average kids in an average place. It was a retirement community. Who would think that two kids from there would have moved far, far, far away to the West coast and be working in like, in their dreams, doing the thing that they wanted to do, who would think that would even be a thing, much less that they'd be working together and much less they would still be friends, you know, <laughs> like, how does that work? I think it's just right. it's, it's terrific. So I think it's a good measure of maybe we're maybe both not jerks or, or something like at least not to each other. Well, good work, Chris Higgins. And uh, for anyone who wants to check this out, URL. What's the URL? Uh, the best way to get there is tetrischampion.com. That will redirect you to Kickstarter and you'll find a best of five, the classic Tetris champions. But again, tetrischampion.com will just kind of get you there real quick. And you better do it fast because it's really going to wrap up really soon. And uh, any further money we get, we're going to throw it on screen. I mean, you're going to see the money there. Um, so I... 
I appreciate, you know, I appreciate the people who've listened this, this far. And if you have, and if you want to toss in a few bucks, that's great. I will use it and I will thank you for it. Tell us what that URL is, Chris Higgins. All right. It's tetrischampion.com. That'll bring you directly to the Kickstarter project. It'll just kind of redirect you over to the weird long URL, tetrischampion.com. All right, Chris Higgins, this has been very good talking and hanging out. You're a good guy, and I like working with you, and this is the end of the talk chat. <laughs> Thank you. I feel likewise. All right, let's go, uh, let's go take naps. Okay, bye. All right. Thanks, dude.